And to end this first episode, I'm joined by the developer of DLC Quest, uh, Mr. Ben Kane. How are you? Good, thanks. How are you doing? Yeah, really good, thank you. Um, so, DLC Quest has been one of the more popular indie games on the 360 since its release. Uh, what do you think draws people to your game in particular? Uh, honestly, I think a big part of the appeal on the Xbox Indie Marketplace is just a catchy-looking box art. It's, it's kind of sad to say, but I think a lot of the gamers that go there aren't looking for anything in particular, so it's just something that stands out in the crowd that gets you enough trials to push you up those charts. I, I'd like to say that it's maybe some widespread feeling of gamers thinking that DLC has just gone too far and they're really looking to stick it to the man, but I don't think it's anything as complex <laughs> as that. It's it's probably just box art. <laughs> yeah, the indie section on the, uh, the Xbox Marketplace is pretty crowded and there's plenty of bad games on there. How do you make sure that you're not lost amongst them? Really, I think the best thing you can do is have a strong launch. The way the Marketplace is set up... Um, the games that are performing better and getting more downloads and better ratings are the ones that gamers are more likely to see. So if you can have a strong launch and propel your game up those charts, then they're more likely to get those downloads again, and uh, they basically kind of stick there. It's it's this weird scenario where the rich get richer, and if you aren't noticed right off the bat, there's a good chance you'll just sink and never be seen again. So publicity when you first start your launch, is, is that key? Did you have to try and contact a lot of different publications, try and get your game out there? Oh, absolutely. This is definitely one area where I, I don't think anyone's got it totally figured out, and I'm certainly not the one who knows the most about it, but I try out new things all the time just to see what sticks. One thing that I found particularly effective is to stay really active on Twitter. And if you can basically befriend a lot of other gamers and journalists and and talk to them genuinely on a day-to-day -day basis. It makes it a lot easier to get their attention when you do have something that you're about to release. Much better than just going dark for six or eight months and then suddenly trying to contact all of the gaming press and say, hey, pay attention to me, because <laughs> they just won't. Is it the same kind of idea that's led you to start your YouTube show, Indie Chatter, uh, try and keep in contact with the community? Yeah, that, that was absolutely one of the main driving philosophies behind starting Indie Chatter. It, it really is sort of an experiment in sharing what I'm working on and keeping in contact with more and more like fellow gamers, honestly. Um, I'm not entirely sure where it's going, and I may not have had totally concrete reasons for starting it up, but definitely one of the prime drivers was just the idea of staying visible when I don't have a game that's like imminently on the release charts. Sure. And I guess with you being a one-man team, it's quite nice to make sure that you know you've got a community around you, and you want to you want to be part of it, not just yeah, like you say, wait until your game comes out and then be hey, look at this kind of thing. Yeah, it, it's nicer to be a part of a community rather than just someone who releases a product and then disappears again. Sure. And uh, now six months later, you've just uh, released DLC Quest on the Mac App Store. How's that been going for you? It's been going spectacularly well, much better than I could have expected, really. One of the strange things about it was the game actually came out on Mac back in February when I launched it on PC. I did kind of this dual launch on Desura, uh, but Desura doesn't really have a Mac client going for them, so they don't drive a lot of Mac traffic. And I guess Mac gamers just weren't aware of it there, or certainly the Mac App Store is just a lot more accessible. So it was just kind of this cursory thing where I decided I would go through the release process and see what it was like to put a game on the Mac App Store. And then suddenly it's it's kind of exploded again, and it's doing really well. Does it surprise you to see that you know this game that you, you released six months ago, it's almost um, rejuvenated the interest in it uh, just by... Uh, heading over to the Mac App Store. It it really is. It's it's the best kind of surprise, though. The the game itself took me maybe two months to make, and I was really hoping just to see a nice return to make those two months worthwhile. Maybe it would stay on the Xbox charts for two three weeks and make a bit of money to make that worth the time investment, and then I would move on to something else. But instead, it's uh, it's caught on on the Xbox marketplace. It did rather well on PC, and now it's come back around, it's doing well on Mac again, so it's definitely a surprise. I didn't expect to still be kind of dealing with this game six months on, but I'm, I'll take it any day of the week. 
Did you find that, that transition difficult to make from uh, 360 to the PC and then the Mac? Is a lot of time spent uh, adapting the game for those ports? Going from 360 to PC is a really easy process with the XNA framework. You, you do have to take some PC specific things into account. You have to deal with different key bindings and resolution settings, make sure you're really making use of the monitor and the fact that the user is now only like 20 inches from the screen. Uh, but other than that, there's very few technical things that need to change between Xbox and PC. So that part of the process is very, very straightforward. Going to Mac, on the other hand, is not a supported sort of publishing avenue as far as the technology is concerned. So you end up using some third-party libraries which are in a state of constant development. So really, you just kind of have to try them out and see what's broken and then hope that either you can fix them or you can find someone else who can. Do you think we'll see uh, DLC Quest on any other platforms now that you've seen it perform so well on the App Store? The most requested platform is definitely iOS from here on out. Um, I'm still not convinced I want to do that, largely because I'm just I'm not sure how the touch controls will translate. Um, I've played some platformers on iPod and iPad, and they're not fantastic. Having said that, I do get enough requests that I will probably look into it sometime in the near future, at least to give it a shot for my own sake and see what it's like. Definitely the success on the Mac App Store uh, has me a bit more interested in that. I, it took me by surprise yet again, so I figure I should probably listen to the people asking for an iOS version and try that out. Heading back to the, the 360 version for a moment, uh, can you kind of walk me through the development process for a game like DLC Quest? Uh, yeah, well, DLC Quest was my third game on the Xbox platform, so I'd kind of gotten a hang of all the things that need to go into passing peer review on the on the Xbox marketplace. So I was well aware of all the potential pitfalls that you can fall into uh, with regards to multiple controller support and batteries and controllers dying, people pulling memory cards and things like that. Um, so I sort of had a framework in place where I didn't really need to deal with any of those things directly. I had, I had already accounted for them. And that meant I could really just focus on making the game. And that's why I was able to put it together so quickly, because I really just sat down with a very clear vision in mind and just plugged away at it for just under two months. So you, you're obviously using XNA Game Studio in that time. What do you, what do you make of that uh, software? Uh, I would say it's absolutely fantastic for beginners. It's really where I got my start for indie games. It's got a, a ton of documentation on a lot of samples. It still has a reasonably active forum with a very helpful community. And if you're just starting out, it's, it's very logical. You can work your way around it quite easily and you will probably be able to make what you want to make. There are definitely some limitations around their networking services. You you can never talk to the outside world, so you're not going to be able to connect to the internet or anything like that. You won't be able to get leaderboards or achievements. Uh, but those are limitations that really aren't going to affect a lot of games. You can you can still make a lot of things with X and A, and if you ever decide to go onto PC, uh, those restrictions are lifted, so you can do basically whatever you want. Really, the big downside to XNA is that Microsoft has more or less abandoned it. They're, they're not really planning on updating it, or at least that's sort of the general consensus of the, the developing community, because uh, we haven't heard from Microsoft in quite some time. They're, they're very quiet when it comes to dealing with their XNA developers, and if that could change, then I would absolutely wholeheartedly recommend it to anybody. As it stands, uh, I'll, still, I'll probably still stick with it for now. But, uh, yeah, if, if you're looking to get into it, I'd, I'd just be aware that Microsoft is kind of pulling out their support. And when you finish a game using XNA, you submit it to the marketplace. What, what's the process there? You mentioned peer review before. How, how likely is it that your game won't be accepted? So peer review is actually a pretty easy process to get through. The idea is that you submit your game and then... Other registered developers will run it through a, a checklist of various issues, and if your game doesn't fulfill all of those requirements, then they'll issue a fail, and it, it only takes two fails for your game to never see the light of day. 
Um, but then you can just fix them and resubmit it a week later, so it's not a huge setback for you. Uh, the th big misunderstanding comes in what those fails actually entail, and they're usually pretty catastrophic things. Like, if your game crashes or hangs, you'll fail, and if it contains something absolutely inappropriate for Xbox Live, then it won't go on there. But other than that, there's really no quality assurance, and that's why you see a lot of, like, My First Game or Pong clones and things like that on the Xbox Indie Marketplace, and that's because it's totally allowed by the system that's in place. Uh, the rules that Microsoft have set up are very, very forgiving. So if you're a beginner and you want to get your game on a major console for sale pretty much around the world, then Xbox Indie Games is a great way to go. Um, what, what are your thoughts on the, uh, you know, how how open that marketplace is? Because there's there are some real gems there, but there are plenty of bad games. Do you get frustrated with that, or do you kind of just accept that that's what you know an indie marketplace is about? Well, it seems like there are two schools of thought on that issue. Um, one is that people think that uh, the restriction should be tightened considerably so that there is less uh, less in the way of bad games that you have to sift through in order to find all the good stuff. Uh, and the other school of thought is that having it so open is what makes it a unique and frankly appealing marketplace. And that's the school of thought that I subscribe to. I don't feel the downside to Xbox Indie Games is that there are a lot of poor games on there. If anything, I'd say the downside is on the presentation side of the marketplace for the consumer who's looking for games. If they have to sift through all the bad stuff that's there, then maybe the marketplace interface is doing something wrong. There, You can easily float good content to the top without having to prevent all the other content from ever making it to the marketplace. There's There are better ways of dealing with it. So I'm, I'm happy that it's open. I think a lot of good developers have gotten their start there, and their first games are definitely some of the ones that you might say shouldn't see the light of day. And uh, that's the kind of thing that you don't want to discourage. So I'm happy having uh, everything on the Xbox Indie Marketplace, like warts and all. And yeah, just to wrap up this interview, is there anything you can tell us about the future of Going Loud Studios? I know that you're busy working on a new game at the moment. Yeah, the future of Going Loud Studios is, uh, is largely dictated by what I choose to do with myself. And for the foreseeable future, I'm still planning on working on my own. So that means that the games I come up with are probably still going to have my my style of humor infused in them. Uh, they're also probably going to be fairly simplistic because I, I do run a one-man show, so I'm responsible for all of the programming and art, uh, for better or worse. And uh, other than that, it's going to be games that I personally want to play. Um, I'm definitely in this to make the games that I want to make. Uh, you're not going to see me put out a Minecraft clone, that's for sure. Um, and other than that, the, the best way to keep up with what I'm doing is just try to find me online in one of my many manifestations. If it's on Twitter or YouTube or a blog, uh, I try to be around. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much for your time, Ben. I'll uh, make sure to include a link to Ben's YouTube show, Indie Chatter, his Twitter account, and of course, goingloudstudios.com. Um, yeah, I really appreciate you stopping to have a quick chat. Oh, thanks for having me.